For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization, and is made possible through financial support from our listeners. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a recurring monthly supporter. If you feel inspired to contribute, you can make a donation by following the link in the podcast notes. You can also help by sharing our podcast on social media and writing us a review on iTunes. Rewilding is about returning to a place-based relationship with the land where we live. While native cultures have their own specific ways of doing this, my perspective is generally framed around my own experience as a white settler living on Chinookan lands and how I go about rewilding from that context. If I want to have a relationship with the land, indigenous people must be a part of that relationship. They are part of this land, no different from other elements of the land that have been exploited to the benefit of civilization. If I want to have a relationship with the land, I need a relationship with its original people. Otherwise, it would be like ignoring an entire species in the landscape. Imagine if I wanted to connect with the lands of the Pacific Northwest, but never interacted with cedar trees. That would be absurd. Why do so many settlers not extend this same thinking to the people and their cultures who have lived here since time immemorial? They are a part of this place. Building these relationships must start with atonement, reparation for a wrong or injury. Rewilding is not yet another opportunity for settlers to appropriate native culture and lands, but rather an opportunity to atone for the actions of our more recent ancestors as assimilated colonizers on this land who destroyed native cultures and stole their land so that we could exist on it today. In making reparations to indigenous people of the places where we live, We can also heal the wounds of loss of our own indigeneity from the time when our ancestors were colonized and assimilated hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Rewilding without this atonement is simply another form of neocolonialism, and therefore not actually rewilding. In order to rewild, we must have meaningful engagement with the history of the places we live and the original people of that place, as well as a deep understanding of our own histories of how, when, and where our indigeneity was taken from us, and how we ended up where we are now. Today my interview is with David Lewis, a professor of anthropology at Oregon State University and a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. For many years, David served as tribal historian at Grand Ronde, and since leaving his post has continued to vigorously research and share the known native history of the Pacific Northwest, through speaking engagements, essays, and his popular blog. He was the first keynote speaker at the annual North American Rewilding Conference, and has also provided land acknowledgments and the context around why that is important at various Rewild Portland programs. As a historian and an anthropologist of mixed racial and ethnic backgrounds, David is one of the main people I have looked to in order to understand the deep history of the place I live now and to understand the cultural complexities of this place and how one might give back to the land and its people. Our conversation begins with me asking him about an urban legend I grew up hearing in Portland and branches out from there into a wide range of topics. Here in Portland, I grew up hearing the story that the word Willamette meant 
the valley of sickness and death and that no native people ever lived here. Um, I remember hearing that again in my early 20s and thinking that's got to be bullshit and researching it and of course finding out that that wasn't true and that what's was eventually led me to start going to the language classes at Grand Ronde um, here in Portland. But I just want to ask you if you could speak to that myth and tell me a little bit about the real history of the Willamette Valley. Yeah, I mean, I think that I've heard that myth a lot. I've heard people, you know, in Salem and Portland and other places say that. It's a pretty common contemporary mythology. Some people call them urban legends um, about the valley in terms of its meaning to the tribes. And I know that that's, you know, wrong. You know, there's no translation of Willamette to Valley of Death. I think that there was something of a reputation in the valley of there being a lot of of hay fever and a lot of like diseases that survived here pretty well and that maybe it was born, maybe that that mythology was born out of this idea that, you know, the tribes, 95% of them or so all died off in the, in the 19th century, in the 1830s, 1840s. And where it's well documented is in sort of the Lamp Valley. And so I think that maybe some of that, early research on sort of epidemiology and diseases in in the valley. Somebody sort of came up with this idea that, you know, maybe Willamette means Valley of Death. It's clearly not true. Willamette is actually a, it was originally a place name. It was a Willamette or Willamette uh, village on the Willamette River below the falls. So, you know, kind of in the Gladstone Mm -hmm. type area. And so that's where the name comes from. I know that other tribes have said it comes from like Yakima or whatever, but it's not it's absolutely from this village here that mm-hmm. where people were first came to Willamette Valley and they met the people and knew the people of that village. And so they, they adopted that word as part of the meaning for the river and then meaning for the valley itself. And uh, there is no all-consuming sort of name for the valley that has any kind of real meaning like that. So Willamette actually means a place where there are sort of riffles, a place where there are, you know, these like um, small riffles in, in the river, mm. you know, po- possibly it would be a, a place where you could, you know, have a good fishing hole, essentially, you know, where you can find salmon and stuff like mm. that. So. Mm-hmm. As far as Portland's location, it is on top of a village site. It's not like there were no people living in this particular area. Is that correct? Uh, well, but the city of Portland is pretty vast. It's bigger than any kind of native village in the area. You know, there were no sort of well-known village sites in, in what's called sort of downtown Portland. Lewis and Clark noted that there were some sort of longhouses on, on the embankment. I think they got some information that those were like seasonal longhouses that were put there for people to sort of go to a fishing site in the right season and, and sort of probably put out mm-hmm. some sort of a, a dip net or put out some sort of a gill net so that they can catch fish and stuff in that location. The other parts of Portland up to, you know, Portland, the city, you know, involves now areas all the way to, towards the Sandy River and all the way over to what we call Salvia Island now, which used to be called Wapato Island. And so mm-hmm. there were villages on Wapato Island. There were villages on the edges of that Willamette Slough area. And there were villages down, you know, there was a big village there at, you know, Blue Lake and that area. So there were these villages in, the, in these sort of outskirts area of what we call more, uh, I guess, uh, rural Portland in, in a sense. So In the vein of delving into the history. Can you tell me a little bit about your website and your writing and why you do what you do? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a trained anthropologist and also a native person. So, um, you know, part of what my growth was as a, as an adult was, you know, getting into college and, and like a lot of people nowadays and learning about, you know, myself, learning about like who I am and stuff like that. A lot of people do that in college and stuff. And, I wanted to understand more about sort of why my tribe had been terminated and then restored and then understand more about the histories of my tribes, of the tribes of Oregon, which is basically Western Oregon. And because nothing was really taught, you know, there was, when I was in college, there was almost no education about, you know, the history of the tribes of Western Oregon, history of tribes of Oregon even. And so I sort of set out on my own with like almost no direction from anybody to find resources that where I could learn more about my people. And there wasn't much help from my tribe because my tribe had just been restored in the 80s again from being terminated. 
and their story seemed to be lacking some key points in it. You know, I came to find out later on I could correct those things, but hmm. and so my my work over the past, you know, since the eighties really has been to sort of understand more about my people, where I come from, where I come from in Oregon. And then in the course of doing that, you know, I developed this sort of I'm all, almost like a I'm a collector of native, you know, books in a sense. So I have like thousands of native books in my library and stuff. And so I've also been collecting sort of native documents, you know, articles and, and dissertations and just papers and mm -hmm. letters, all kinds of things. And so I now have a, a gigantic collection of, you know, something like 300 gigabytes of native stuff that I've digitized and placed on my computer wow. systems. And so, so now, and I've been doing this for, you know, 25 years or so. And when the tribe sort of let me go, as, when I was like working there and they decided to let me go in 2014, I decided to sort of continue on with my, I, what I thought was my role, my, my developing role in the tribe was to be sort of a tribal historian. I didn't necessarily need their approval to be a tribal historian. I can just still do that work. And so I, I have this sort of gigantic database of, of things I've been collecting over years. And uh, I began sort of accessing that, that a different way rather than just collecting it all. I began reading it all. Mm -hmm. And so, and I had been reading it all along. I just, I began putting some, some, you know, putting, you know, two and two together and making four out of mm -hmm. a lot of like these essays. And I, I would find these letters from the national archives or letters from local archives that are all sort of related or about the same people, about the same events, mm. about the same stuff. And then I would put it together in these sort of essays that showed more sort of detailed histories of the tribes in this area than had ever been seen before. Because there are a number of books. I mean, Stephen mm -hmm. Del Beckham and, you know, uh, Schwartz and, you know, Robert Boyd. I mean, they, they've written all these books about the tribes in the area. But nobody really thought it seemed like to go go into sort of more detailed history of what was the day-to-day -day workings of the tribes especially around the events that um, are recorded really well by the United States, you know, things like removal and treaties and reservations. And, and so I found in those, in that sort of col colonial era, this is what I call, call, call the colonization era, when the tribes are being so sort of removed, there's tons of, of details about, about the tribes, about what they were going through, that can be ferreted out of all kinds of letters and, and, mm -hmm. and writings mm -hmm. of journals and whatnot. And so I'm able to put all that stuff together into to show context. And so that project has sort of led me to write a blog site. Now I have over 400 essays on the blog site, and, and it's growing like weekly, mm -hmm. daily sometimes. <laughs> and, and because I have read all this stuff and I've had all these experiences working with all these different tribes in Western Oregon, I now... My my area has expanded to you know south southern Washington all the way down to northern California, mm. and I can put like broad now patterns together, not just tribal. You know, I'm not just dealing with like the Californians, which I do, but I'm able to put together broad patterns that are happening in the region. You know, like mm -hmm. if there's a war happening in the Rogue River, how does that affect the Californians in the valley? Mm. So you can so and then what are the actions of sort of the Indian agents at the time? Why were they making actions in, in, on the Oregon coast when there's a war in the Rogue River Basin, which is somewhat separated? And I, I'd be able to see these sort of broader patterns mm -hmm. happening where there's like larger impacts on uh, tribes, decisions being made about tribes mm -hmm. and for tribes or on behalf of tribes sometimes, and put those essays together in, so that everybody can access that stuff in an easy way. So I saw the blog system as a way that I can um, get stuff out really sort of quickly. And so be responsible by, you know, referencing things, trying to, you know, edit my own stuff, which is not as easy to do as you, as you may think. And then that information could be sort of readily available to anybody online that is struggling with, try, you know, how to teach about this material or how to, or learning about it themselves or don't have the access to the materials that I ever had. And, you know, and there's a lot of sort of generalists out there that want to understand Oregon history. And so I'm, I'm feeding sort of that. I'm also feeding a lot of sort of uh, educators out there who have in the last, you know, 20 years or so been curious and have wanted to develop resources for education about Native peoples in the area and didn't have materials, you know, mm -hmm. like how many books are there written about the Kalapuyans? Two. Right. So 
there's two published books. So you can look at those things. Those are basically anthropological accounts. So they tell you something, but, 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 but the stories about context are more important. I mean, and I, so I wrote these things up as short stories that everybody can sort of access and use as teaching aids for the, in the classroom if they want to, you know, with pictures and maps and all the stuff you sort of need to teach to a classroom, whether it's fourth grade or, mm-hmm. you know, eighth grade or, or, or 12th grade, you know, whatever it is. So, and uh, I'm finding that that whole project has been very, very successful. I have now over a thousand people that are subscribed to it. They're, that they're that watching my, my progress. I have, uh, those are regular attendees and I have 60,000 people now that in the last four years that have looked at my site and I've gotten over, you know, 120,000 looks. So it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's growing pretty exponentially. Every year I get more and more and more totally. people because the whole database is open. You know, everybody's always has access to that. And then I also have the, I have the opportunity then that you don't really have in published papers of going back and altering details. Mm-hmm. If I find something's wrong or I find new stuff, that can add more depth and detail to the story. That's awesome. So that I have completely complete control of that too. Yeah. So, so there you go. Yeah. Cool. I've definitely in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I've definitely you know gotten a lot out of your blog. I'm a huge history dork myself, and it's just been a really great resource for me. And I really appreciate yeah. um, all of your essays. So yeah, thanks. Um, one of the, yeah, I think in particular, at one point, you know, I was living in Malala, so I wanted to research a little bit more about the Malala. And um, I really appreciate being able to read more about Crooked Finger. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Right? Yeah, yeah, he was like, he's like, of, he's like my hero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's one of my next questions, which is, yeah. you know, in doing this research, are there any, you know, historical figures that you've learned about that have inspired you? And if so, who and why? Yeah. I mean, some of the rebels, people that were considered like these, these, these anti-American mm-hmm. you know, leaders of the American mm-hmm. of uh, Native peoples, have turned into kind of heroes for me, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. the things they say are just like <laughs> incredible. Mm-hmm. So Chief John of the Rogue River Confederacy, he's he's a, he's one of those mm-hmm. leaders that he says some pretty cool things about the sovereignty of his people and mm-hmm. and, and really caring about his people and wanting to do the best for them and stuff. Mm-hmm. Crooked Finger is another one. Crooked Finger just did the most incredibly rebellious things, you know, in the midst of, of watching his all his land be taken away. Yeah. And he's he's talking about it. he's like, you're yeah. taking away all my land. And yeah. so I'm never I'm never going to see all this money. Give it to me all now. And and he's he's actually real. Mm-hmm. That's a real statement for a real person. That's a that's a human statement. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it sort of goes around these sort of ideas that Native people didn't really know what's going on. They're just mm-hmm. like passive victims to the whole situation of colonization. And and he was like, you know, give me all my stuff now because you've never paid me for our land. And I'm never going to, I'm not going to live to see a, see a check. Right. So give it all to me now. And if you don't, I'm going to go continue going in, in these, these people's houses and take advantage of your women. You know, so it was like, <laughs> and so that's what he was doing. And it wasn't like advantage. I don't know if it was sexual or not, but. But in the newspaper uh, reports, he was uh, going into houses of pioneers when the when the men, when the men weren't home, and ordering the women to cook for him. That's what it said. Mm-hmm. And and so I, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, it, you know, and he was threatened. He was like, "If you do that again, we're going to kill you." Yeah. And eventually, he was killed for doing that. But right. You know, he was basically really upset that the, the, the colonists were coming and taking all of his land, and he was treating the people his people badly and all that stuff. Yeah. And the third one, I guess I'd point out, would be uh, Chief Paulina, or Paulina, however you want to call that. He was a, a chief of, of the Paiute peoples. That guy, man, I want to read more about him because he was cool. Hmm. He he had this band of Paiutes. I think they're they're part of the Yahuskin band we talked about for the Klamath Reservation, and they traveled all around Eastern Oregon from Hell's Canyon down to the Klamath region, up to the, the Wasco or the, the Warren Springs region. And they were attacking everybody. They were attacking wagon trains. They were running from the army. They were attacking Wasco settlements. They were attacking, you know, the Warren Springs reservation. Mm. They were attacking them. <laughs> and so he didn't care. He was like, I'm going to attack everybody because I, I hate what's happening. I hate mm. what the, the Americans are doing. They're taking all of our land. They're treating us like crap. And so 
I'm just going to attack everybody until they shoot, they shoot me. And that's what eventually a wow. farmer shot him, but he was cool. I mean, he was just like, screw you. I'm doing whatever I want to yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And they got, and they named a lake after him, you know, mm. pa- Paulina Lake. So, mm. or Paulina Lake, whatever you call mm-hmm. it. Yeah, another question. In doing your historical research, what's the most surprising thing that you've uncovered? Well, I, I'm constantly pushing this issue of how all this information is not like new stuff. It's been around for a long time. These letter groups have been in the archives for years. Historians and anthropologists had access to this stuff for for generations. And yet... Nobody before me, it seems like, have got into this stuff and have looked at some of these more detailed histories of the tribes. And I'm finding sort of new things that have never been written in history books. Or if they were, they were sort of hinted at, mm. but they were not looked at as, a, as an important thing. For example, I mean, I found these histories of the tribes being placed on these sort of temporary reservations in the valley and on the Columbia before they were placed on the permanent reservations. Mm. And those temporary reservations, they're like 12 or 14 sites, you know. And so nobody else wrote about this stuff. Yeah. And historians, like I said, historians have had this stuff and just ignored it. And I think that there's been this, I mean, if you read, if you, there's lots of different history books available now digitally. If you want to read Oregon history, you just go online, on like, especially Google Books is the best site. And you just look up like History of Oregon. And so there would be like, there's something like 30 or 40 books on there that you can download for free and read the whole thing. And almost always what I've noticed is that if you read through the history of Oregon for each individual author and you can look at the, look at the, watch the year, it's almost exactly the same for like 80 years. There's no changes. It's like these, these historians weren't doing their work. They weren't mm-hmm. going and looking for, at the primary sources. They were not right. finding the stuff, the new stuff that made their history better. And so it's really surprising to me that I sort of came upon so much new information in a relatively short period of time that no other sort of trained historian or anthropologist had ever really looked at very closely. You know, and, and if they had, they just ignored it. And so, and, and I think that that goes in one respect to the way that history has been sort of compiled by these historians. And, and I think that there's been these sort of broad criticisms of historians and history as being uh, written in sort of a nationalistic way where they want to sort of what I call aggrandize, you know, the American, you know, expansionist and the, and the, 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 the role of the sort of like settlers of, of walking the trail for nine, ten months and, and, their, and all the hardship they went mm-hmm. through to sort of claim this land from Native peoples and, and talk about those, those pioneers being sort of the heroes of American history. That aggrandizement has overshadowed the fact that they basically destroyed whole nations of peoples in order to, to take this land. Right. And that other perspective is important too. Like most of those histories, don't, the historians didn't seem the re- any reason to go talk to native people about what they were going through. There was no reason to. It seemed like up into the 1970s to actually go talk to native people about their history. We see that sort of change in the 1970s. We start to see this sort of broad criticism of history and, and anthropology as not including the, 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 the opposite or the, the minority perspective being sort of brought into the theory about how you do history, how you do anthropology. And then, then you start to see these other histories appear where, uh, where we have other perspectives. You have the white perspective, you have native perspective, or you have white perspective and black perspective, or white perspective and, you know, maybe... Chinese or Japanese or Latino or whatever perspectives that took a whole long time to get to. Yeah. In the meantime, we have a, a, you know, for a very long time, 120, 130 years, a really kind of a nationalistic history written. And so that is kind of a problem because then that's sort of ingrained into, into totally, you know, a lot of Oregonian sort of knowledge about the, about things. And so, you know, those are some of the points that, that I found pretty amazing Mm -hmm. you know and i guess as sort of i'm not a new scholar by any means anymore but but it's sort of as in this generation i think every generation needs to discover how their sciences and practice in the previous generations 
and be sort of critical about that. And so, and my thought has always been that we needed to, as scientists, be critical and not just accept the static images of the past as the way things always are and look at how things have been written about in the previous, you know, in the previous generations and, and be critical of that and say, what, what have they not done that we could do better? Totally. And, 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 and go out about like that. That's science, you know, science is not static. It's a dy- dynamic thing. And for historians and even anthropologists to criticize people who are stepping outside of their box and writing new things is being really critical of their science, Mm -hmm. the way that science actually works. Mm -hmm. Knowledge. Knowledge always grows. It's not going to stay static. So that makes me think of another question, which is, as a native person and a formally trained anthropologist, how do you bridge the Western academia, science, anthropology with your indigeneity? And what are the challenges in that? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes that's set off as, you know, it's polar opposites. You know, you can't be indigenous and be anthropologist at the same time. It just doesn't work. And I think that's inaccurate. I think that native people have always been very much um, scientific about their environment. You mean... Clearly, they took probably longer to do their experiments, but they figured out things. They figured out how to make all kinds of high, highly developed technology. You know that stuff. I mean, most people that you know don't know how to make the things you make. You know, like right. you could probably flint nap and make make bows and totally. nets and just all this stuff, right? And how did I mean? How many people do you know can, can make fire from two pieces of wood? Yeah, not a lot. <laughs> that, I mean, it's a pretty highly developed technology. Totally. It has to do with friction and, you know, there's engineering involved, there's physics involved in this, there's all this stuff. And people figure that stuff out. So I think people, I think Native people are natural scientists. They're naturally curious about what's going on around them. They're, they will adopt new ways of doing things all the time. When, when people saw that the metals and cloths that, were, that the Europeans brought were better, they began adopting that into their culture. So I think that there's this uh, miscategorization of, of Native people and scientists of being sort of polar opposites. I think that where that became the problem is when, in our American society, anthropologists and other social scientists took advantage of Native peoples by taking knowledge and things from them and not giving anything in return. And we, there's a huge sort of like history uh, from the beginnings of social sciences of Scientists saying, well, we're just, you know, non-biased. So we're just going to do all this work and we're going to take, we, we need to sort of benefit all of mankind. And we're just going to take knowledge from you and publish it and become, you know, study it and learn things. But Native people noticed, you know, it, you know, and they started criticizing this in like the 1960s. Like, you've been taking this stuff from us for years, for over 100 years, 150 years, you've been taking stuff from us. And we've never seen any kind of benefits from that. You know, we've never, yeah. that's not come back and helped us. We've, we're now poor societies living, you know, basically in welfare in the United States. And we've been that way for a long time because you've kept us down. And so the sort of racism uh, uh, involved and the privilege involved in society is keeping us down. And we have less access to health care. We have less access to education. And so it was, you know, noted by like people like Vine Deloria Jr., He's probably one of those heroes that they, we could talk about in terms of Native peoples in the United States who wrote this up in a very detailed, reasoned, scientific way and said, look it, they're supposed to be helping everybody with their science. That's supposed to sort of help mankind. They write books about it. They become experts. They, then they think they know more about the, the culture than Native people do. And nothing ever comes back to the tribes. And, and, and that's really because they don't see tribal people as, you know, they see people, tribal people in sort of this, the racial way, a racial sort of categorization. They don't see Native people as being uh, able to be unbiased about their own right. culture, you know, as being, you know, logical and scientific about their own culture. Totally. And so he, he would say, that's not just not true. You know, we've always been scientists, you know, and so... Why, and, and that criticism led to allowing more and more minorities into social sciences from like at least the 1950s and 60s on. And uh, we start to see sort of this growth of women, minorities 
in anthropology since that time. And so, um, and that's served to sort of change the whole discipline where scientists realize that, you know, we need different perspectives from different experiences from different cultures in our science to make it stronger to actually find those things that will benefit society. Otherwise, all you're getting is the perspectives of basically white males, right? You know, old white guys, yeah, about culture, about society, and that doesn't benefit everybody. Totally. You know, what about women? Why don't we allow perspectives from women to come in? What about minorities? They come from a totally different culture. They may have a a, a unique perspective on their own culture, very informed about their own culture that may be useful to everybody. And maybe they could be part of that decision-making body, like the scientists that could make decisions. And, you know, I was criticized pretty broadly when I went into anthropology at, at U of O, and, and I, there was a, a native scholar who it was a literature scholar, but she was like, you know, native people have no business being anthropologists because she's taken on this sort of like almost the DeLorean type attitude about, about, about science. And I was thinking about that and then my experiences, I said, you know, anthropologists are going to continue their work, whether or not we're part of it at all, you know, so they're going to continue working on tribal stories, tribal context, tribal culture. And if they're doing the wrong thing, then there needs to be somebody like myself and people like me to be there to say, Hey, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're not going to respect just anybody. Right. They only like the way it is, the way the hierarchy works in, in academia, they respect people with like PhDs. So I said, I said, well, I have a head of steam behind me. I'm going to maybe get to the PhD level and then we can begin to influence things in, in my area. And, and, uh, and so I don't see it as at odds. I think that, um, I think that if anything, I bring a critical perspective that is necessary in the science. And I think that people that are not critical about their science, uh, maybe need to rethink what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. In my rewilding programs, I often use evolution and paleoanthropology and like, you know, in one of them, we talk about prehistory and I start back with like Homo habilis and, and then move on to Homo erectus. And we talk about migrations and things like that. And I'm always sort of nervous in regards to that because especially if there's a native person in the class, I sometimes yeah. I'm thinking, uh Oh, like this is a very, in one way, Westernized history. And I know a lot of native people have their origins within the places where they are located. Um, and so I'm, you know, for me, I'm always trying to find bridges to communicate what rewilding means and talk about it. And for me, that, that sort of evolutionary science and human migration and stuff is one of those things that I use to bridge with multiple cultures. But then I'm always like, uh oh, there's this um, sometimes come, you know, comes up with the creation idea of place. And I'm wondering if what you think about that in terms of like bridging those ideas. I know there's some people in Western society or white people who believe in like Adam and Eve in terms of like a creation story. And there are archaeology yeah. sites that actually, you know, the Garden of Eden could have been and probably was like a real place, you know? And so, but then there's also this sort of like metaphor of Adam and Eve as like just a, a, a mythological metaphor of our origins. And so I'm always trying to like figure out a way of bridging those concepts with native people. I'm wondering what you think about that. I'm just one native person. Everybody, every sure. native person can have their own Absolutely. idea about, you know, their origin story and every tribe will have their own story. Totally. And people in, in the tribes are going to have various perspectives on that. Um, a lot of people in the United States today, even native people are in, heavily influenced by Christianity. And so they've been sort of, indoctrinated into Christianity and, and assimilated into that, that way of thinking. There are some folks I know that go both ways that, that are, they'd be Catholic as well as they're, they're native. And, and so they'll do both ceremonies. Hmm. And I've asked that, I've asked that. And I said, how can you be Catholic and be, and do also native ceremony? And they say, well, you know, we, native people are a lot of times opportunists in terms of our, our religion. And we just, we do everything just in case. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> so, so I'm like, Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it kind of plays out. If you read some of the histories, you'll see like whatever 
you know, whenever minister missionaries in front of each each tribe will will be very influential about that tribe, and they'll and the tribe will say, yeah, we we believe all that. That's that's really great. And then the next one will come along. There'll be a different denomination, and they'll, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, we believe you too. And <laughs> and it's like they're very very opportunistic mm-hmm. about who they believe, what they believe. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's that's one thing. But you know, there are there are those that are clearly you know Christians and are brought up in the Christian faith. And don't uh, necessarily believe in sort of the native stuff. And there are native people that are very sort of hardlined about that they, you know, came from here. There's no, there's no possible way they, their people migrated from, you know, Asia or something. And there's no migration that, that, you know, our stories tell us this. And that's exactly what happened. You know, we came from, you know, a division of the fishes or something, you know, mm-hmm. like whatever the tribe mm-hmm. has their origin story, that's what they believe. And, and there are some people that just don't see, some people see problems with that. Some people don't. You know, there are these sort of documented cases around the world where different indigenous peoples have adopted two or more religions or spiritualities, and they're not in conflict. I mean, that's that's the case with a lot of Japanese people. You know, they they have the, so the Japanese mythologies. They also have the you know the Shinto. The, mm-hmm. A lot of people are also Buddhists. You know, and so. That's the same thing in, in, in China. That's the same thing, you know, in Mexico. We'll see some people that are indigenous in Mexico. They'll be sort of Catholic in, the, in the, what they practice. They'll go to church, all that stuff. They'll also have the sort of Day of the Dead stuff going mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. you know, the Madonna stuff going mm-hmm. on, which is Catholic but different, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's not in conflict all the time. It's, it's, it's part of – it becomes a new culture in a totally. sense. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but – yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot about rewilding as a living in multiple contradictions. And so I feel yeah. like that definitely helps me sort of think about how to talk with folks who might be willing to accept that there are multiple realities happening on top of each other. I have one more thing. So regarding that, I mean, just about culture itself and Native people, lots of us have a tribal culture and sometimes several tribal cultures like there's the like for grand ron there's like grand ron culture there's also powwow culture and if i step outside of that and live in salem i live in i live in basically this oregonian culture here and that's a consistent thing a lot of people go will culture shift all the time you recently posted um an article about the dna testing of native people and it's re- and it's relation to the land bridge theory. Yeah. And I'm this is just I'm confused because it was like the land bridge theory has been disproven with this <coughs> DNA test, but then the DNA test shows that people migrated through Asia. Isn't that the land bridge theory? I mean, this is maybe not even part of the the interview. I'm just like. <laughs> curious like because i i've seen this multiple times now where it's like the land bridge theory has been debunked but also the dna still shows that people came around through the Bering strait is that wrong well that's um, i think that's part of the language they're using i don't think everybody is indoctrinated in sort of multiple ways of people could have gotten here so i uh and that's you'd have to really look back at their study to see what they're accessing in terms of theory um, because a lot of times what we're getting is like the the public face of that, you know, where it's it's written in the science magazine, which is not necessarily the study. So right. we're getting like this sort of more public social media type posting, totally. which is not not really detailed. Um, but in terms of the language, a lot of the language is picked up, you know, by whoever wrote the social media post. But uh, a lot of times they will translate things as land bridge. When in reality, they're not really suggesting land bridge. They're suggesting somebody got here and they could have, and they came through the sort of narrow gap between uh, Siberia and, and Alaska. It doesn't necessarily say, I mean, there's no way to read a DNA and say, well, they were walking. There's no, nobody actually can read DNA that, that closely. They could have been on a canoe. They could have been in a kayak. Mm. They could have been in all kinds of things. Mm. They didn't have to walk. They could I have see. been in a dog sled over right. the ice pack, you know? So so the fact that there's been ice packs for thousands of years after the last, you know, especially after the last ice age, we're kind of in this warming trend now, but there was ice packs. 
And the Inuit and Eskimo people have always said, we have relatives over in Siberia that we go visit all the time. So that suggests there's mm. never been, there never hasn't been right. a connection. Totally. The, these people in the north just stay in the north. They don't go anywhere else. And they will migrate every few years across the ice pack using their dog sleds or walking or whatever it is, or maybe kayaks, uh, to visit their relatives who speak a similar language to them over in Siberia. And that's been the case for a long time. So the fact that they're writing, you know, land bridge into the article does not mean that's what it proved. Totally. That's what, that's what they're writing. Because there is these now newer theories that are more uh, detailed and more accepted by Native people about folks at any time being able to come over across from Siberia or across from, you know, Asia in, a, in canoes or boats. Right. You know, because we've had sail technology for so many thousands of years totally. now. And so there's no possible way. I mean, if, I mean, what I talk about in my classes are, you know, if the theory theories right now are accepting without doubt that people got to Australia 60,000 years ago by boat, how is it not the same theory in the North? Totally. Because the people in Southern Asia are not that far removed from the people in Northern Asia or anywhere in Asia that could have jumped into canoe and gone to the east rather than to the south, you know? Right. So, you know, so the technology existed 60,000 years ago. There's no other, you know, people didn't necessarily swim across you know, that, that sea to Australia. They didn't have airplanes. So how'd they get there? Mm -hmm. Boats, you know, yeah. they had to be by boats. And so just because they're saying land bridge doesn't mean it is land bridge. It could be canoes. And then the canoe travel suggests it could have happened anytime oh, totally so i don't know i mean i'd have to i'm not a genetic researcher i'm not looking at the genetics and part of the problem is in genetic research right now is a lot of tribes and tribal people are not lending their dna to the test so you have very sort of rarefied small samples that are being looked at and so i would want to see their sample size their margin of error and, and look at their study before I, I believe anything they say. So. Totally. And who knows how much of that's all going to change in the coming years anyway, as they figure out more and more about DNA. And That's right. Yeah. Right now they're yeah. saying this, you know, five years from now, they're going to say, hey, we found a different kind of DNA and we have. Totally. You know, or we found footsteps on the bottom of the ocean. I mean, who yeah. knows? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. In your essay, We Tricked Them, We Were All One People, you spoke about how the distinctions between <laughs> tribal groups was not as clear-cut as they are today. Can you tell me a little bit about tribal identities prior to contact and prior to colonialism and reservations and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that, that essay has raised a lot of uh, of eyebrows. You know, people are like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I don't know if I believe that, but, you know, there's a lot of, like, sort of infighting between tribes today over territory, over casino area, all kinds of stuff, or fishing area sometimes. I don't know, you know, if I've helped out a lot with that essay or not, but, you know, I got, I clearly got that from another a little lady that who sort of grew up in Warm Springs, but who's Grand Ronde. And she says that, you know, in the background of a lot of stories about the colonization, about the reservations, about the people here, you can see that we're all kind of interrelated, that we're all really, that the people that were like Cascades and the people that were at the Dog River or the, or the Hood River area were actually integrated as part of the, sort of the kin relationships of the people in the, in the Clackamas area who were also related to the, to the Kalapuyans, who were also related to the lower Chinookan peoples. You know, and we can see all these relationships manifested in the in the in the the genealogies and the and the ethnographies and everything else and so it's uh it seems to be holding up that we are basically all interrelated we're not necessarily one tribe but but we but we are all are part of a larger sort of culture of interrelated people in oregon and so I, that, it was my offering to sort of help quell the differences that are being emphasized today politically because people, I mean, tribes are like at each other's throats throwing lawsuit after lawsuit about all kinds of things 
you know, fishing territory, whether you own a piece of land, whether you, you know, whether you belong, whether you deserve to be a tribe or be restored or whatever. And, and I, and I wanted people to understand that we're all more related than we're, than we're not. We all have these sort of genetic relationships that you can't, you can't really sever. And maybe people should think about that, that we're all basically in the same situation. We're all living by, on the behest of the United States government and, and, and and we're not each other's enemies necessarily. We're basically related to each other. Mm-hmm. We're family. And uh, so um, that was my intent. That. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and it just made me think too about the, even the names that exist today, like Chinookin, you know, comes from the village sites, a nook that was at the north end of the mouth of the Columbia, but wasn't necessarily what, people called themselves who spoke the language right right i mean there were individual like political tribes i mean there were individual like bands around certain leaders and stuff you know but yeah i mean we're in terms of culture i mean there's going to be differences up and down people little cultural differences in the language there's like dialects of language there's but it's pretty much the same i mean if you were to place people in the dows at astoria they could do all the same culture right there. Mm-hmm. This is interesting because I remember reading just too in terms of like the diversity of language. I think the first place I ever read this was the book Aboriginal Slavery on the Northwest Coast of North America, where it mentions that there were like 10 different languages spoken in each village up and down the Columbia. And I just thought that was amazing. Um, yeah. Well, so switching gears a little bit for me, I'm I'm trying to constantly sort of sift through problematic aspects of rewilding and there's the oppression of people by the state you know and the demonization of indigenous people and people of color and other people from a a white controlled state and so there's this sort of inversion of that in rewilding i think where then people idealize indigenous societies on a level and that can be problematic as well yeah so i'm curious from your perspective what is that line of demonization versus romanticization is this something that you feel you sort of skirt as well in your field well i i try to avoid romanticizing things at all i mean that's part of the problems with history or history is broadly romanticized native peoples and sort of limited them to a very sort of limited functions. Um, you know, they're either they're either savage warriors or they are, you know, I don't know. We call them satyrs in, in the woods. You know, that, I mean, what are they? I mean, I mean, are they the? I mean, that's romant. That's part of that romanticizing romanticizing mm-hmm. native peoples and and this idea that native people are somehow attuned to nature or people of the woods is so romanticizing it's incredible you know i've heard this not just from white people i heard from native people because they believe it and stuff and so and that's kind of i mean there are these like new mythologies that are sort of built up by white society really you know as a way to sort of redefine itself in a positive way and i think that's what's happening with with this romanticism it's like people knew that they'd done horrible things to the tribes but that they want to make it look better. They don't want to believe that their grandparents and their parents and even them had done really horrible things. They want to look like they saved them from something. Mm -hmm. And so I saw, I've read some of the histories that are written in the 1920s and, 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 and later about what happened in Oregon in colonization. And there's a lot of talk. There's like, well, we, you know, we brought our missionaries there and our great pioneers came in and they brought their religion and, and, and they did this wonderful thing. They saved the tribes, you know, from their savagism and they saved the, you know, this whole thing. That's all part of the romanticism. And they, then they alter the story like, you know, Frederick Balch's bridge of the gods. He actually alters the story of a native story where he says, well, this, you know, chief Multnomah, he had this sort of half, you know, Japanese daughter who suddenly in the middle of the story becomes white, you know, and all this stuff. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, 
it is a line that people skirt, and I think that people need to, again, like I say, cast a critical eye at these things, that these assumptions that we have. Like you said earlier, the you know, valley of death, and you know, that's one of those assumptions, or that, you know, Native people had slavery, you know, as, as just a statement, you know, or mm-hmm. I, I think that maybe your the people in your wild movement probably skirt that line a lot. I think there are a lot of people that get involved in that, you know, thinking that they can adopt sort of native philosophy and native ways and go back to being sort of nativist in the forest, you know. And I think that's, you know, one of those things that people need to have caution about, you know. You know, they, they, there are these other societies that lived in, not necessarily in cities and rural areas that, you can be like, it doesn't have to be native people. Mm-hmm. You like your own sort of Celtic peoples or something, but, or the Britons or whatever. And so you don't necessarily have to be my native people. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's a good answer. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good yeah. answer. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, totally. Spitballing um, that one. <laughs> yeah. I think about, you know, when you said the like, uh, the romanticizing of like being one with nature and things like that. And I think about like, there's two things that, that I have found in my research, which is that like the diversity of native culture is so vast that it's impossible to say like native people did this or that, or were this way, right? There's just like so many different expressions of society that existed. But the second thing too, I think, you know, the inversion of demonization of native people as like wild savages uh, to the sort of like pristine lovers of nature comes down to like the reality of like western civilization looking at itself after destroying the planet or causing the sixth mass mass extinction and looking at these native societies that weren't doing that (laughs) and it's like it's they weren't necessarily like one with nature in this romanticized way that we've projected but i feel like the majority of indigenous societies had or were constantly figuring out balanced existence within their environments yeah this is that exactly part of the the culture of that i mean that's a lot of cultures in the world have that i mean like i think that's part of the buddhist culture as well of balance and everything so but native society has always been this idea not necessarily being one with nature but living in sort of a balanced way with the with the with things around you with the people around you with you know the animals and plants and thinking and thinking about things around you a different way than than just as resources to be exploited and so that's different that, that's a different way i mean these are the animals and plants they are our brothers and sisters the everything has a spirit in it the mountains have spirits the 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 storms have spirits the the rocks have spirits the animals everything out everything has a spirit and so some of those spirits are cunning and some of those spirits are evil and some of those spirits are good and and native people are that way too. I mean, native people. There's this assumption that all native people are basically good people that are living in the forest and stuff. And if you look back at and even today at native society, there are evil people, and there are good people, and there are people everywhere in between too. And there are people who go back and forth. There are people of multiple cultures. There are people of multiple religions. There are all this stuff going on. And and so like you said, there's not one way of being native. There's multiple ways and multiple things. And and Native society, even though it's thought about as a sort of pristine, you know, society that before it was destroyed by sort of westernization, by by civilization, had good, bad people in society in their societies all the time. And they had laws, they had rules, and the only reason they had those things is because everybody was would be doing crazy stuff without laws and rules, you know. And so yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. I mean, it, people sort of hang on some people's like their words, like ooh, they're 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 imparting some sort of wisdom, and 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 we're just figuring shit out too. <laughs> you know, we're just like, mm-hmm. we don't. I don't know what's going on. We're, we're, I'm figuring stuff out too. The people around me are figuring stuff out. Sometimes we have a better notion. We have a a different uh, notion of the world around us than the other people. And, and and I think that everybody needs to do their own studying in their own way and figure out where they where they belong in that. Yeah, you know, I think, yeah. you know, rewilding to me is 
is, I think, very similar to decolonization in a way, um, in the sense that it is about trying to find this balance again. And so I see it as something that everybody, it's a problem, you know, that everybody is working on in a different capacity around the planet. And so I'm, for me, you know, as a coming from this culture, you know, a lot of people say that white people don't have culture and then that's why they appropriate. I don't think that's true. I think that um, the culture is not great. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, there is a lot to be learned on how to live sustainably on the planet from learning from di the diversity of native societies without romanticizing, without demonizing. Um, well, I, I think you're right. I think it's um, how do you think about the things around you? Are they just resources to get you, make you wealthy? Or are the people around you part of your community? Is the place you live part of your environment? Because a, a lot of Americans, you know, are like, well, I'm going to go move to, the, to, to Portland because I can make money there. And then when, when I find a better job in L.A., I'm going to move to L.A. And then I'm, if I find a better job in New York, I'll move to New York. And, and so nobody is like tied down to a landscape. Totally. There people are, a lot of people are just like moving from place to place in, in, in chasing the buck around, you know, totally. chasing the dollars around. And they don't really ever ground themselves in any place. And even if you were living in New York City, how do you ground yourself there? I've right. been there. It's a pretty hard place to ground yourself yeah. unless you grow up there, right? Yeah. So if people are not, so that, that, that when people say lack of culture, I think it's lack of rounding. It's lack of mm -hmm. making a commitment to the people you're around mm -hmm. and the environment you live in mm -hmm. and following through with that, with your responsibilities and that commitment. You know, mm -hmm. if you want this place to be a not good place for the next generation, your, 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 your relatives, your kids, their grand, your grandkids, their great, grand, the grand, great grandkids, whatever. If you want this place to be as good or better than how we have it today, you need to make, you're responsible for making decisions in your life. Change your culture, change the way you do things, change the way you think about things so that you are grounded in this place. Hmm. And not, and get away from this notion of chasing the dollar around. I mean, people, some people do that and, I guess it, some people, it may work, you know, they could work for 40, 50 years or, and, and make a bunch of money. And then in their sixties decide to, uh, or seventies decide to sort of settle down and become around. I mean, I guess that mm -hmm. may work for some people, <laughs> but yeah, but if they're in a culture, a, a, a economic system that destroys and that never builds anything, totally. never preserves, never. Yeah thinks about the future, you know, and they've done this for 40 years of their life, you know, what have they created? Right. They're not grounded at all. They never so, will be grounded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I have a hard time. Like that's one of the aspects of rewilding to me is like finding that groundedness where you're at. And it's always been relatively easy for me because my family has been in Northeast Portland for 130 years and I've researched, you know, the lineage of my name anyway the bauer name all the way back to through russia to germany and stuff um and i know where all my relatives are buried in in portland it's obviously nothing in comparison to you know one time somebody i was hanging out with eric bernando who you know and uh somebody was like oh wow peter you've your family's been in portland for 130 years that's crazy i'm like yeah well eric's family's been in this area for over 12,000 <laughs> years you know and he was like well not here you know my, miles down the river this way but <laughs> It's Over there. Fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just <laughs> miles, you know, not, not very far, but, you know, it's just interesting to think about that kind of lineage and how much that would make you care about the place where you live. If you actually had to be there forever, in a sense, and get all of your resources from those places, I think, you know, a lot of the a lot of the colonization that was taking place was just resource extraction. So the people who were living here weren't really, like, invested, obviously, or the people who were like cutting down the trees, you know, that's right. That's right. So they just have no interest in actually maintaining the sustainable. No, they're, 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 right. They're just trying to get wealthy. That's yeah. exactly it. That, yeah. I mean, the, the whole reason to capture the West coast by the Americans was to make sort of more opportunities for Americans here, but also to 
to cap- capture the port towns so they could trade with, with China, totally. trade with Asia. Yeah. So it was all economic. The whole reason was economic. Yeah. And yeah. and yeah, so go ahead. And it makes me think too about like what you're saying about people joining the military because they don't have any other options. I think about like a lot of the, you know, in, in terms of my ancestors, they were they were basically bought or bought and paid for it in Germany to go farm in Russia by Catherine the Great. And it was because they were poor with no other options. And here's this other country saying, hey, you know, we're going to pay for your travel. We'll pay for you to come out here. You don't have to pay taxes for 10 years. You can do whatever you want. And basically the same kind of thing where they were throwing these settlers into the Eurasian steppe, um, you know, essentially using the poor as a front line for colonization to make the wealthy wealthier. You know. That's exactly what's been happening you know, around the world for yeah. centuries now, yeah. and it's almost always a lie. I mean, totally. For a while, the Chinese are brought in here to, to build railroads and be gold miners, right? For, and then Japanese are brought here, you know, to do be workers as well. And then, you know, and, and then they were never given citizenship for a long time. So, and, you know, the same thing's happening in like France. You know, they yeah. brought all these Africans and Vietnamese to France to work in the fields, and now they don't want to pay for their upkeep. You know, yeah. So it's it's just a uh, it's colonization, and and yeah. I think we're all still living yeah. through this colonization, and racism, and the ways that you keep societies in control through sort of racist actions and stuff, is part of that is is part and parcel of that colonization. Totally, yeah, and I think in order to you know end that in regard to like decolonization for me is exactly what you're saying is being grounded, and then if we're going to be grounded here. How do I work with the people that are here? How do I be a good, you know, there's lots of language around, you know, being an immigrant or a settler or a guest or um, uh, an orphan or, you know, these different things. Like for me, I want to know how to live here sustainably. And so, of course, the people that I'm going to go to and then realize I should be supporting are obviously going to be the native people here, which is where I think the bridge of rewilding and decolonization kind of come together in that regard. Um, and so one of my last questions um, is, you know, uh, what characteristics do you look for in people like with my demographic, for example, you know, white settler descendant that you found make it easy or exciting to collaborate with in regards to your work? You know, what esen- essentially what qualities do you look for in like an ally or collaborator? Um, I think that you have to be somewhat respectful of of the the place of the tribes that were here. Um, I think that there are these cases in or in especially in Portland where people have assumed that um, if you're a tribal any kind of tribal, you are of this place, and that's not necessarily the case. A lot of different tribal people don't come from here. Their families have been here for a couple of generations, but they're not necessarily from here, and they need to so there needs to be some respect for the people that were here, like you said, for 12,000 years or more. Um, I think that also it's incumbent upon allies to do their own, do their research and understand more about the cultures as much as possible. And not in a sort of, like you said, a romanticized way, but really try to understand the history of how we got to this place of why the tribes are just now being restored or, now their economies are coming back. Why they have to have casinos? I mean, all these re- all these things that are happening in tribes, you know, that have sort of kept tribal people down for the longest time. Um, and then, and then just be an ally for whatever projects they're doing and stuff. It's not a lot of times I hear outside organizations come come and join our project. We're going to restore an oak grove or something, and that's fine. But what about, you know, when tribes are doing projects, what, where is the support then? You know? Totally. Yes. I mean, seriously, like, yes. when, Grand, when Grand Ron is in the midst of fighting with other tribes about their, their actual history, undeniable history of living at Oregon City for thousands of years, and nobody else living there except for the Clackamas people. And this is undeniable. It's like all over the text everywhere. And yet other tribes in the area are stepping forward and they're saying, that's not true. You know, we were here actually, not you, or something like that. Or you don't belong there. Where is it? Where is the support from the surrounding community that, that knows about this stuff that says that is true? You know, I, I will support that position. I mean, we know 
I know why the other tribes are saying that. There's this aspect of, you know, casino politics at play or, you know, salmon politics at play in the area. We understand that the rest of the Columbia was destroyed by, by the Army Corps of Engineers in terms of a salmon stream and that we know we need to remove dams and we know we need all this stuff to, to sort of help the other tribes and stuff. And it's unfair for them to come down and, and tell like Grand Ron, the Clackless people, that, that they don't belong there. You know, they can't have a fishing hole there. And so those things, I think that it's it's kind of incumbent upon society, people who know better, to step forward and say mm-hmm. what's right. What's what's right. And yeah. to be informed about tribal politics is, that's happening in the region. To not just be not understanding what's going on. You know, we like I try to understand as much as I can of all the politics happening in Oregon, in Portland, in Salem, in Eugene. As well, I try to also keep abreast of all the politics happening in any country in the area too. Mm-hmm. So I know I know why, for example, I know why the Chinook, Chinook, Chinook Nation is having a hard time getting restored. I know why. There's a lot of issues there. Totally, yeah. I, I know why the tribes like Warm Springs are and, and Yakima and Cowlitz are upset that Grand Ron's putting a, a fish, a fishing platform at Willamette Falls. You know, I know, I know all these mm-hmm. things. I know why the Klamath are having a hard time securing fishing rights in the Klamath River. You know, I've, I've seen the history of why of, of the United States giving away all the water in the Klamath River to all the farmers for potato farming or for ranching and not, and not, taking into account the tribal treaties in the area. Mm-hmm. So I understand that as well. And so, yeah. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon people to basically understand as much as they can of both issues mm-hmm. and to come in with this sort of reasoned approach. Mm-hmm. Cool. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, I don't know. What, <laughs> what, why do you want to know this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, why do I want to know this stuff? Um, well, I think, you know, it comes down to what we were just talking about a couple minutes ago, which is just, to me, rewilding is about grounding in place. And um, while I don't want to romanticize the people of this place, I, I also recognize that there is a culture of oppression and occupation that exists here that I've benefited from. So if I want to become a part of this place or... You know, I don't know if I'll ever have children, but if I want to leave a legacy behind of helping other people to become part of this place, to me, that means making these connections and bridging these different demographics of people and elevating the people of this place and their voices using the privilege that I have been born into through this occupation that we still all exist under. Um, And so, Yeah. yeah, for me, you know, there's there's this line of uh, I'm I'm just constantly reading things that are romanticizing and things that are demonizing and I feel like it's hard to be an ally in some regards because some of my friends want me to romanticize in a way or I feel like there's some romanticization going on and if I don't accept that romanticization then um, you know, I'm racist or something along those lines. So to me, it's kind of like trying to figure out how to move as a settler without saying the wrong thing, or if I do, how to apologize and see through what I've done. And so just the number, the more and more conversations I can have with a diverse demographics and lots of people from those to kind of get all of these different perspectives, because obviously the, like you were saying earlier, it's not like there's one perspective um, around like, you know, origin stories even. Um, yeah. And so just trying to like figure out how to be as broadly appealing and f- and connective and figure out what is like the basis of connection between all people that's beyond all of the cultural things that we've like overlaid that keep us apart. Um. And so I think just, you know, I really respect your work and especially because you seem to be someone who's willing to be this bridge. Like it, it really feels like that's 
one of your roles like as a professional academic and a tribal historian your role is essentially bridging those worlds and so i just um you know ever since i've been following your work i just have a lot of respect for what you do and i really um well well, well thanks that's a good good to hear um you know what what's interesting an interesting perspective is that none of us are completely native there are there are very few people anymore in this area that are 100 percent native so i have a pretty significant background genealogy of uh English, Irish, Scottish, German, and French, and Belgian. So, mm. so what, what's funny is that, you know, you're putting me in this, you're saying that I'm in this sort of category of being a bridge, but I'm there already. Totally. I'm not, it's not like I'm not part, not, I mean, if you look at my blood quantum, I'm actually only about an eighth native. So... I'm I'm actually more white that, mm. in terms of the blood quantum than native. If that means anything at all, which it really doesn't. Sure. So yeah, <laughs> so and that's that's part of the game that a lot of native people play. It's like, well, I'm native, and the fact is, 99% of those those people that say I'm native also have a pretty significant white ancestry too, or non-native ancestry, not necessarily white, could be black or anything else, but mm -hmm. ancestry. So, and they are, are automatically in this place. And they can't escape from it of, of being in parts of at least two different sort of definitive cultures, one which is native, which they take on as, as their persona, and the other one is being sort of in sort of the non-native capacity as well. I mean, I have, my mom is not a native person, so I, you know, my dad's dead, who was, who was the native mm. person in my family. So, you know, so... I'm constantly sort of not necessarily code switching. I'm just being that person. Totally. Who are in between these two things. I'm when I do my genealogy, I'm as I'm looking at my genealogy of the native piece, and then it's actually taking longer for me to get to the genealogy of the of the European pieces too. So yeah. So so I guess those of us that 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 are native that have, that have been now self defining as native or identifying as native have decided that we are native in the sense, um, and that's that's a big step forward for a lot of people mm -hmm. a lot of people are still in this era this phase of saying well my great grandmother was a cherokee princess or some right. you know yeah. stereotype like <laughs> yeah. that so and that's a stereotype mm -hmm. i know but that's you know mm -hmm. what people say and and i'm and that but they're not saying i'm native and that's a significant step forward right yeah totally you know it's like you do would you say you're german right now <laughs> <laughs> no, but my dad you, always said you're German, you know. But I don't consider right. myself German. Would you say yeah. you're Russian? Yeah, right. No, yeah. No. So, so, so you're you're calling yourself white American as we call itself to me. So right. I consider you a white American. Totally. So, but you could say I've been learning about my German past, and I'm actually German. Yeah. I'm a German. I'm a German American. Yeah. You could say that totally. le legitimately, right? Totally. Or Russian yes. American, German yeah. Russian American. I don't know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you could say that. So, so. We are, I guess, Native people are, in, in this context that we're talking about, are uniquely situated to understanding the white world we live in. You know, I'm calling, you know, this Oregon world the white world. It's actually a multicultural world, sure. multi, multi ethnic world, and the Native world that we also live in. Yeah. So some people cho choose to interact in those ways, some people don't. Yeah. My hope, I think, with rewilding in the bridge to decolonization is to help people with multi-ethnic backgrounds to anchor that white identity in an indigenous identity back in the original continents before civilization colonized people. And so I think, you know, with rewilding, it's really about that, about finding that identity back to one of those one of those cultures that everybody had at one point in time before colonization of, you know, before civilization colonized everybody. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of like problematic aspects of rewilding, but I really hope in this journey of finding it, being able to communicate with lots of people and create bridges and stuff is to be able to like link that ancestry um, and plug that into everybody I don't know what the hell I'm saying. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I, I think uh, that that's a that's a pretty interesting. I mean, when I was 
taken lit, lit classes at U of O. Um, one of the classes I took offered the the book Ready Your Saga. It's pretty interesting. It's one of these like, Icelandic tales, and the the story is actually documenting for me the uh, the beginnings of of Catholicism in Iceland. Hmm. Interesting. And and sort of the end of of the indigenous culture, and. You can see that, and I I saw that pretty clearly in the book, and I don't think the the, the instructor saw that, but but when when people are living like in the in the first part of the book in their indigenous culture, they're able to get together on a yearly basis with the various clans and sort of hash out their problems through this like you know for, for, with fighting. You know, they get together and mm-hmm. they just fight with each other until they say, okay, we've done it, we're done, we figured all everything out. They got the winner is the guy that won you know the fight and that kind of stuff, and and the but then when Catholicism comes in over the period of years and begins to sort of change things and changing sort of people's minds as to their spirituality, they no longer could figure stuff out in Iceland. They had to send somebody 3,000 miles away to Rome to figure for the Pope to figure stuff out, which took several years. And so in the meantime, people, the, the various clans in Iceland are really pissed off at each other, and so they're having wars. <laughs> with each other because the guy is still going to uh, to the pope in rome right to figure yeah. to, to to figure out the argument yeah and so and finally he comes back you know and then stuff develops but but you see the problem he's mm-hmm. this sort of colonization comes in of co- colonial sort of uh christian catholicism and changes some everything so radically that people lose their ability to make their own decisions mm-hmm it's all handed to the church. Yeah. And the church is based in Rome and nobody nobody knows what to do. Right. And so I think that part of what you're doing is also sort of recapturing an idea of people's sovereignty over their own actions. Totally. It's 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 like people have given away the sovereignty of themselves to the church or to the president or to whoever they're fascist leader is and <laughs> and can't make decisions until that that's that person says something yeah but people need to recapture their personal sovereignty and and be able to make their own decisions again absolutely cool if, well if nothing if nothing else we we talked for an hour and a half so. <laughs> that was awesome thank you so much yeah okay. thank you so much for coming on yeah thank you My conversation with David left me thinking about many things, but mostly about the complexity of our lives and the situations and contexts in which we exist. There is no doubt about it. Rewilding is messy work. There are many politics involved in settler and native interactions, and many politics in native-to-native interactions, and everyone has a different view around these interactions and different views around the politics all the way down to the individual level. This is why we need, as David said, in the context of the scientific community, multiple perspectives in order to make our process stronger. The goal of my work as a catalyst for rewilding is to inspire people to become what I call cultural ambassadors. If we are to ground ourselves into a place, we must learn the ways and culture of the places we live. Cultural ambassadors are people who are curious and devoted to understanding and embracing the complexity of cultures for the purpose of cross-cultural pollination and transfer. Cultural ambassadors understand the links and needs between cultures and provide the appropriate exchange. They are bridges between culture who inspire connection and innovation across cultural lines. This connection is where the birth of new culture begins. To walk away from the artificial white settler identity and become a person of place, we have to start here. In his book, What Kinship Is and What It Is Not, Marshall Sollins defined kinship as mutuality of being. Kinship means that what happens to one also happens and is felt by the others. As a return to placed-based relationships are one of the goals of rewilding, Cultural ambassadors represent a first step in building kinship with the land and its people. I encourage everyone out there to reach out and respectfully engage with the history and people of the place where you live as a means to becoming a cultural ambassador of rewilding.
I hope you enjoyed this show. To connect with David, check out the links in the podcast notes. It's a tough time for all of us to make sure that I can continue to bring you content that enriches our lives with resilience. Please become a recurring supporter of the podcast. Leave me a review on iTunes and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or sign up for my mailing list on my website, petermichaelbauer.com. Until next time. Thank you.